Thank you, Prakash. If I could invite our discussants, uh, Professor Luja and uh, Tan Sen, Professor Sen. Thank you. Um, so I think um, as in the first panel, we'll have each of the discussants speak for up to five minutes, and uh, they each will speak in succession about the papers uh, that were presented. So, Professor Luja. Okay. Nienbola Sharma, you touched about uh, uh, interesting and also a sensitive uh, uh, part uh, with regard to the life of his activities in, uh, in China. Yes, his purpose uh, was to try to win independence uh, uh, by seeking Japanese assistance uh, for his support. And uh, the question is, uh, why? Yeah, suppose yeah, general boss uh, rely on and uh, have confidence uh, in Japan to help India to win independence. What was his grounds? He talked so, he thought so, but his thinking was different from what he used to think. And also he thought and uh, talked in a way quite different uh, from average Indians and uh, all the re almost uh, all the rest uh, in the rest of the world, uh, the other thinkers, other people, including common people's thinking. So boss, uh, he was a very smart, very uh, intelligent person. Uh, how could he rely on Japan so lightly? And, uh, and he we know that uh, Rabindranath Tagore, uh, both uh, the two people uh, are well known uh, in India, and uh, both, uh, both of them were Bengali. And uh, Tagore, before he uh, went to Japan, he thought highly of Japan. Also, he also um, put his hope uh, on Japan in leading the whole Asia. Uh, was uh, modernity. But when he really uh, set his foot on Japan, he found a lot of problems, he uh, found uh, nationalism in Japan uh, growing. And then that uh, he publicly uh, denounced uh, uh, Japanese uh, military, militarism. And uh, but later, that uh, when uh, Japan really occupied China and uh, took all that, uh, wrote uh, poems and uh, delivered speeches, uh, writing letters uh, to Japanese uh, poet, uh, condemning Japanese uh, occupation of China. Why did the Subas? Both were Bengalis; they were contemporaries. Uh, didn't he know Robert Nax Tagore's uh, reputation? Didn't he respect, uh, didn't uh, pay attention to what Tagore had done and had said? Uh, I think that uh, uh, you made an interesting comparison. I think that point was very good uh, between Subas uh, and uh, Wang Jingwei. Wang Jingwei, interestingly, that in China, he was uh, all the time regarded as a traitor of the Chinese nation uh, and in collaboration with uh, the Japanese aggressors. Although he said that uh, my purpose was to, is to save China uh, from the disasters in a roundabout way. And uh, I think that he was sent to, uh, he was denounced by the Chinese. And in recent years, there was a phenomenon in China. So some people began to think about uh, Wang Jingwei, his uh, cooperation with uh, Japan in a different, in a different way. And that's a interesting point. That uh, also about uh, Chiang Kai-shek. Uh, did he really uh, want to fight with uh, uh, Japanese uh, aggressors, or he was reluctant to fight? against the uh, Japanese aggressors. This point also needs a further clarification. 
As we know that uh, Chiang Kai-shek uh, was the actual leader of uh, the Chinese people in their fight against the Japanese uh, occupation of China. Uh, at, uh, finally, I have a question that, uh, so Subhas was a well-known, well famous uh, uh, Bengali leader. Uh, when he worked together with uh, Japan, wasn't he afraid of someday his reputation would be greatly affected because of his uh, doing so? That's my comment. Thank you. OK. Uh, I was just looking at the nature of papers, uh, five papers on comparative uh, study of India-China, one on India only, uh, and uh, Nirmala's paper on uh, India-China connections, not comparisons. Uh, I don't know how many of you know about uh, Nirmala. Uh, many of the historians of China in India are retiring. Uh, it's a dying breed, um, and I feel happy that a uh, new emerging scholar like Nirmala, uh, historian, uh, are coming up. Uh, I think it will be the next generation. Uh, I know Nirmala has spent uh, days and perhaps also nights in the Indian archives uh, looking through various files, uh, and uh, we should appreciate the work she has been doing. Uh, and let me also mention the importance of the period that she is looking at. Uh, I think this is something quite neglected. Uh, if we are to understand the contemporary relations uh, between India and China, I think this period of Republican China uh, is quite important. This is when Tibet becomes an issue. This is when uh, borders are, are becoming important in India-China relations. This is when the two countries are collaborating in many different ways. And as Nirmala shows, there are problems uh, as well. Uh, not all views are same among the Indians with regard to China. Uh, now, that, that said, uh, uh, I'll, I'll just will focus on three aspects of uh, Nirmala's paper. The idea is to give her constructive comments, so don't feel bad. Um, uh, one point that I think I should point out uh, right away, as, as you said, are you the only one working on INA in China? No. Uh, Priyadarshi Mukherjee has written uh, two books on Netaji in China. Uh, he has translated a number of uh, Chinese language material uh, from 1943-1944 in Chinese press, especially about what they are writing about INA and Netaji, which is very important. Uh, the view that you are giving is from uh, the INA side. Uh, and then, as Paula mentioned, sources, and I said not all sources are same, right? Some are legitimate, some are not. Um, and, and so I think it will be important to look at the Chinese sources. Then there are British sources, right? I mean, if you look at the Foreign Office files, uh, there are detailed records about INA in, in China. Uh, I think that's very important as well. And there's a fourth uh, group of sources that's from Japan. Uh, and the Japanese are also writing about, uh, 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 about the Indians who are participating in their movement. Mm. So I think uh, in order to reach a, a proper uh, analysis, do a proper analysis and reach a proper conclusion, you need to consult all different kinds uh, of sources and, and see uh, what we understand uh, of, of Netaji, uh, even though he's a Bengali, I think it's difficult to understand Bengalis. Um, but, but I think uh, it would be good to see how uh, there were different perspectives. And, and even from the Indian side, I think uh, uh, the modern review uh, that came out from Calcutta and the Indian Annual Registry uh, also has a number of uh, issues regarding how to look at Japan and how to look at China at this very important period of, of world history. Uh, so I think that, uh, and, and modern review is quite important because there are people writing back and forth, talking to each other, uh, and Netaji, of course, figures in, in that as well. So uh, the first point I was uh, going to make is the nature of secondary literature, where I think Priyadarshi's work is quite important, uh, and, and then the nature of the uh, primary sources, where I think you have to do a more uh, comprehensive uh, work. 
The second issue is this idea of pan-Asianism that you referred to. Uh, I think that is very important uh, given what Japan is doing. Uh, it's not only important for Japan, but also to India and China. All three countries were involved in this uh, uh, hyperbolic issue of pan-Asianism in the beginning of the 20th century. And then when the, when the Japanese started using military, it started collapsing. Um, but then there were, as you pointed out, Raj Bihari Bose. Uh, there's also Tarak Nath Das those who were based in Japan, who despite the military actions that were taking place by the Japanese, were still insisting Japan should be the leader of Asia, no matter where uh, they go next. So how do their views, Tarak Nath Das and uh, Rajpiyari Bose's uh, ideas fit with Netaji? Is Netaji still insisting that Asia should be led by Japan? And, and that brings me to the third and the final question. What you said is a China question. Is it really a Japan question? Right? Um, and just because we are at the India-China Institute, not everything has to do with India and China. Right? Sometimes your conclusion may take you to a different point. And, and if you look at the literature, uh, the discussion that is going on, the issue is not just to sympathize with China. It is how do we deal with Japan? What is Japan really up to? Uh, so Tarak Nath Das, Raj Bihari Bose, and, and others living abroad are, are still insisting that Japan should be the leader of, of China, of, of Asia, while those people living in India saying we have to sympathize with the Chinese and support the Chinese in their fight against, against Japan. So there, there is this, this issue is what question should we ask? Uh, right? and, and, and just because uh, Madhvi is your advisor and you are at this East Asian Studies thing, I think you should broaden your, your uh, uh, investigation. And then if you look at the question of Japan, I think things will be more easier to understand than if you just look at uh, the China question. Right? OK, I'll end with that. Oh, I, I should say I'm not, I apologize for not introducing the discussants, but the biographies are in the brochure here. Please do read them. Mark, me first. Okay, thanks. Um, yes, first of all, uh, thank you, uh, Ing Hong, for writing this, this paper. Uh, it is very interesting, and I, I think some of my comments um, as, as I was rereading the paper this morning, um, many of my comments are drawn from that rereading. Uh, and I think you've, you've uh, in some ways, answered uh, some of the points by way of your presentation. In other words, you seem to have, uh, maybe you, you got an advanced copy of my remarks here and did your presentation. Because I think um, some of the slides, which you had to go through very quickly, uh, really address some important concepts and issues. And I, um, essentially, my, uh, my hope is that in improving, working towards the next version of the paper, you'll simply uh, incorporate some of the ideas uh, and, may, and larger points you have in the slides into uh, the text uh, of the paper. Uh, I think um, we see in this paper, as we also will will see uh, in discussing Prakash's paper, that regime type, and when we're talking about land acquisition, you know, Indian democracy, authoritarian China, really don't matter at all in understanding different patterns of land acquisition and resistance to uh, uh, largely state-led uh, land acquisition uh, practices. Um, I learned a lot about recent uh, patterns of land acquisition in China. You, you draw in the paper um, a boundary I had not yet seen before, which is that of pre and post 1998. Um, uh, I'm not exactly clear why that particular day, but something very important happened uh, around the late 1990s. Um, and it's driven largely by changes a few years earlier, say mid to mid 1990s, in uh, fiscal policy, in the uh, revenue sources that local governments in China, especially rural townships and counties, uh, where can they get their money from? And, and uh, by the mid 1990s, it's no longer sustainable to uh, go in and squeeze uh, direct taxes from, from peasants. Uh, we've led to lots of protests, of course. Now we're going to derive our income, local governments are going to derive our income from uh, land use fees, essentially. And so as you say in the paper, um, uh, you know, amazing, 60% uh, of all local government revenues comes from these land use fees. Now that's up from only 9% 
uh, it, it, before 1998. So there's been this whole sea change in the way in which local finances work, and it's all uh, centered on, on land now. This is just why it's so uh, important, and I think highlighting that change was, was very good in the paper. Um, one of the things that occurred to me as I read the paper, and this came through in the presentation also, is you make frequent use of successful uh, land acquisition and failed or stalled uh, land acquisition. And you know, what does this mean exactly uh, in any context, but particularly in China and India? Um, it, it, to some of us, probably me included, I would certainly say, uh, delayed or stalled land development project, uh, you know, is that a successful or a failed outcome? Um, uh, is a protest that leads to a cancellation of a land development project, um, you know, a positive or a successful outcome. I think in the paper you say oftentimes that, uh, you know, you should have this chart that was also in your presentation of, uh, you know, 600 some odd stalled land projects in India and uh, you, you treated this as, a, as a, a problem or a challenge or a negative sort of thing. And I'm not saying it, it, it means that all is well, but it means that uh, I, I think saying whether that this indicates um, uh, development, which I'll talk about later, or that it, it, it's a, a positive or a negative outcome or a successful or a failed uh, uh, outcome it is, is problematic. And we need some other way of understanding, you know, what a, a um, stalled versus a, a, you know, rapidly enacted land transfer means. You say uh, uh, in the paper you talk about a few cases of successful land transfers in Gujarat and Tamil Nadu. Um, and you, you say elsewhere, quote, many states witness the stagnancy of land acquisition in, in, in other states uh, besides those two. Uh, you cite a scholar who, who says uh, that stagnancy of land acquisition is one of the biggest problems in India's future development. There's that word again, development. So uh, again, it's to repeat the question, isn't stagnancy of land acquisition, um, if it prevents unfair land appropriation, isn't that a good thing? Isn't that a positive outcome? Um, also uh, addressed in the presentation, but not in the paper, uh, was um, essentially, I think we need to problematize this word land acquisition. Who is uh, acquiring the land? And from whom is the land being taken? And, and, and if we way oversimplify, no one's doing that, uh, and you didn't, uh, you know, you think of this poor individual household or freeholder, you know, with the land, and then here comes the state to grab it away. Uh, you know, they're seizing their land. It's much more complicated than that, uh, as you've shown. Uh, but if we start asking questions like, um, it's, it's the land is held in common, it's, it's held by a collective in the case of China, um, it's held by the state, uh, urban land is held by the state, collective land uh, in rural China is held by the collective. You know, wh what, what are we really acquiring and what is, is being traded when we talk about this? I think land use rights are being transferred more specifically rather than just saying, you know, land acquisition uh, is, is happening. Uh, finally, uh, the paper engages, as I mentioned earlier, these big concepts in the title, uh, development, justice. Uh, the title is uh, saying that you're, you, something is between justice uh, and development. Um, but it seemed to me as I read the paper, uh, development and modernity as conceived by the state planners in China and India, uh, you, you seem to be coming to the probably accurate conclusion that, that development so conceived is coming at the expense of social justice, that there's a trade-off between the two. Um, you say so directly at, at the end of the paper, which I'll, I'll just read uh, briefly. You say, even though the tension and conflict are growing rapidly, Chinese land acquisition is still far more effective than India's, uh, which guaranteed the need of development, however, at the, cost of, at the cost of justice and stability of the society. And then India, as a capitalist democracy, uh, land acquisitions there have been stalled due to the rampant protests uh, of the displaced people. This result is, uh, the result is uh, the slowdown of economic growth in India and a zero-sum game uh, for all concerned parties. So you note that China, um, you know, has achieved development while India seems to lack both, uh, both development or slower development, slowdown of economic growth, as you say, um, and, and lacks social justice. But if they're Technically, if there really are trade-offs, then you, you would take uh, you know slower development with a, for a little more social justice, or you take no development to uh, preserve that. Of course, they're not so directly 
uh, tied in that kind of positive sum relationship. But uh, you know, when you start talking about win-win games and zero-sum games, th this is, is somewhat implied. Um, so one question is this, and um, also in the realm of India-China connections, let me point out uh, that uh, Ying Hong is involved in a translation project to translate the uh, selected works of, of Gandhi into Chinese coming out uh, later this year. And, and so he, he is not only uh, interested in India-China connections, but I think is, is actively in that uh, space uh, because a, as we know, uh, as many of us who have been to China, you see there is a, a, a growing interest, let's say, in, uh, in Indian uh, philosophy in 20th century Indian philosophy, especially uh, in the works of Gandhi. Um, but my question is, you know, um, rural development, uh, which is central in, in a lot of thinking uh, by people in the 20th century in both India and China of what our you know, new society will look like, of, of what, where, where we as a nation are headed. And rural development is central, uh, I think, in both the imaginations of, of, of Indian and Chinese intellectuals in the, in the 20th century. Um, if rural development is a means of achieving justice, you know, we're improving the, the lives of the poorest in the society, then, you know, how can land uh, play a part in this? How can land be most effectively used, uh, uh, distributed to achieve rural development? And it seems to me, um, I get from these debates that you're writing about uh, in land uh, acquisition that the only answer is that it has to be urbanized. That the way to achieve uh, justice, social justice, the way to uh, uh, bring people out of rural poverty is to turn them into uh, urban people. <laughs> uh, and this results in the kind of paradox that many have noted, which is that land is being urbanized much faster than people. Uh, I'm saying this from the, the, the China angle much more so th than, than India, with which I'm, I'm less familiar. But um, I, I think that it's worth reflecting if you're interested in engaging development and justice, that then, you know, what is the goal of development, as Vamsi asked uh, an earlier presenter uh, uh, this morning. And, and finally, just very fi uh, final point, uh, very short, is um, you talked about in the presentation local creative practices in land use, and you had a few cases. You've done field work in some cases, or you're going to be talking about Wukan and others. I think uh, the paper would benefit greatly from drawing on your observations on, on what you're calling local creative practices, but it's because I think essentially the most interesting uh, and potentially influential uh, outcomes are generated in that local creative space rather than from, you know, a new uh, land use law uh, passed uh, by the central government it went in either place at any given time. Thanks. Professor Vasudevan. Well, uh, I think, uh, Ying Hong, you have uh, very substantial responses already to, uh, to your paper. And uh, I think uh, not just uh, Professor Frazier, but uh, I think Prakash in many ways is uh, has raised a number of questions which perhaps uh, will help you uh, fill out some of the Indian details. So um, I, uh, I don't have that <coughs> much to do. I uh, will, though, just uh, tread over some, uh, some ground once again. Um, just for the record, uh, I, uh, I, as I said to you, I think in between when we met, um, I really did enjoy the sections of this uh, paper which uh, dealt with the, with both the legislation as well as the practice in China. Uh, I found that uh, extremely uh, interesting. I uh, found especially the, uh, the local analyses. Uh, I think Professor Frazier has already pointed that out, um, which dealt with the fiscal record of the end of the uh, 20th century uh, and the way in which, for instance, the, um, the percentages that were being held back uh, from the actual uh, um, the, the, the levies that were being taken uh, from the acquisition uh, and the way in which there was a mismatch between the, um, the rewards that the community received and the, uh, the amount that the local government retained. This uh, leading in turn to a sense of both injustice, privation, etc. This is rather an interesting uh, insight. But I think it's an interesting insight uh, precisely because you have this extremely wealthy um, description of the guarantees which were already in place in the past whenever 
the commune alienated land or when the state actually within the existing framework and regime uh, actually compensated the commune or other users uh, for the land that it was actually taking over. Uh, I think that run of legislative history as well as, and I don't think it's just legislative history. Uh, it seems to speak for a lot of activity on the ground as well, the way in which you put it. I think that was uh, really a, a remarkable um, uh, aspect of this paper. And if there are examples which are then given of the way in which that has developed both in the past as well as in the late 1990s and 2000s, I think that would be extremely uh, 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 unusual as far as the literature is concerned. And it would help answer many of the questions uh, concerning both satisfaction and dissatisfaction concerning uh, the, um, the acquisition of, of land for uh, industrial and other purposes recently. Um, quite clearly, since I'm highlighting that, uh, there's, uh, it's clear that perhaps I'm a bit worried about the Indian side of the, of the comparison. Um, but I'm, I don't think actually it's something I uh, wish to go into in great detail because some of these issues have been raised by Prakash because uh, he's pointed, I think, to one or two issues which perhaps you could take into consideration uh, in order to nuance the way in which you describe the process of acquisition in India, which is that, um, uh, for instance, uh, a lot of the land which is alienated, which is actually taken over, um, uh, is uh, belongs to one sphere. But in many cases, the disagreements that are happening are not concerning that sphere. It, they are concerning government-owned land, which is forest land. Um, and in fact, the disputes therefore uh, occur because the government itself has decided that nobody else has a right to that but itself. It is not actually planning out according to any strict regulations that it has set up for itself uh, a compensatory apparatus which uh, seriously takes into consideration the full round of uh, social presences in a particular area. So that, in fact, there is no attempt to understand the way in which the Adivasi may be using that particular property, the range of commitments that he has on that property. Now, all this is considered the realm of a kind of anthropology, which, if it finally inflicts itself on the government through the non-governmental organization, will be considered to be relevant. But until that is actually done, the government will proceed with the process of alienation and will not consider that uh, the rules that it is set for the acquisition of property and the alienation of property, the uh, decision of just compensation, the salatium, et cetera, et cetera, that seriously appears in this particular case. So uh, this, I think, Prakash has put forward very adequately, uh, and it's something that you could take into consideration, because a lot of the, um, the justice factor that you're dealing with is not concerning uh, the, the acquisition in the strict sense, because there's no need to acquire. The government already possesses it. Um, so I think that's a dimension which uh, would be uh, an interesting one to add to the way in which you, you deal with this. Now, quite clearly, the, uh, the issue here, um, as far as you're concerned, is that acquisition itself is meant to provide justice. Uh, and that you highlighted in your, in your slide. Um, that is that it's meant to avoid the, the, uh, the land mafia. It's meant to avoid persons who do not have a public vision about property. It's meant to avoid all these particular agencies. Uh, but I think at one point there, uh, there is a, um, a factor uh, in the comparison between India and China that you have to take into consideration, which is that the right of the government to decide on that justice is very is disputed in India, whereas it is not disputed in the case of China, beyond a certain point. Um, that is that the government itself has established its property rights over time. It may have been ritualistic, but it may have been through specific laws that affect the, com the commune. It may have been through the planned economy. It may be through the immediate aftermath of the planned economy when adjustments were made. But whatever the case, the government has asserted a particular right over property in a way in which it has not done in the Indian case. In the Indian case, there is a thing called the property holder who, through that chain which, uh, which um, Prakash pointed out, 
through that chain has established his right to that to that bhumi there is no question about it and uh, in fact this this ritual of the use of the chain is rather a, an important one i mean i've i've been present i think practically every indian has been present at some stage now when the the tehsildar actually marks out the property and actually puts it into the the large map etc cetera, etc cetera. so there is a a particular regime of ownership which is involved here which somewhere you have to bear in mind this does not actually mean though that that regime of ownership cannot in some sense be diluted adjusted uh, concessions made etc how these concessions are made are the other dimension perhaps that you could gradually slip in into the indian case study all right which is you know you've left the the ends of alienation slightly on the margin here and the political economy within which the alienation is taking place and the way this is seen is one of the most burning questions within india as professor fraser pointed out what is the vision of the future that in fact people are playing with what is the vision of myself as a as a farmer is it that i should commit myself either to a migratory existence in which my land plays less and less of a role or is it an existence in which i am driven to suicide these are essential questions so agriculture political economy i would have said you cannot leave out when you are dealing with uh with this issue it's become too loaded an issue uh when from these points of view so these little additions i would have said in, in introducing some of these regime issues prakash has raised that may help you just develop this paper which but i think the chinese section is extremely rich perhaps because you raise these questions on this side you will begin raising them on that side as well you may find that you are making the chinese section even richer than it already is my congratulations thank you very much so our final change change of guard professors acharya and kurian very glad to be here um, coming here for the first time and um, really been following the work that ashok and the new school and the ici in particular has been doing and i must say that i'm extremely extremely delighted uh, at uh, the broad expanse that you are now getting into i mean we were there before when you started these conversations uh, the first time and i remember a great distance we've traveled so so i'm glad to be in on this project and um, now quickly how much 5 minutes so um so i'm going to be quick and uh, not get into the details now the paper that i got prakash and your presentation are obviously slightly different uh it was a whopper of a paper 37 pages and uh, <laughs> it just it just went on and on and uh, Uh, since i did take some time to read that i'm not going to respond so much to your presentation because there are some differences uh, there uh, but i think in essentials you still have uh, have have kept to the main argument that you were outlining in the text that you sent so i think um, it will not be very very substantially different and in any case there are three points that i would like to make um i think the first point relates to the theoretical framework that you have employed now in the beginning you're uh, you you're really concerned with as you put it the and this is it here um sorry yeah 
that uh, you are looking at the, the need to look at the social and political foundations of long entrenched and deep patterns of social and political inequalities. Uh, you are looking, then you go on to look at the interlinkages of land acquisition regime with the closely related political and economic institutions. And uh, then you say that, uh, uh, that, and then you bring in the deeply entrenched nature of the apparently unjust systems of land acquisition processes that independent India borrowed from its colonial rulers. Now, if we put these three elements together, I find that we are actually uh, raising a contradictory perspective, uh, a contradictory uh, kind of a, uh, because if we take point number one, which is uh, the interlinkages of land acquisition regime with the closely related political and economic institutions. Uh, we are clearly looking at the nature of the independent Indian state and its efforts to, while it continued with the legacy of the colonial legacy, which was the 1894 law, uh, but its efforts to set the whole developmental agenda uh, through a, a constitution uh, on a very specific path of development which guaranteed certain rights and pull of, um, prior property was, was a fundamental right to begin with. Uh, subsequently, it shifted from being a fundamental right to being a statutory right, but, but that's part of the politics that comes into play. Uh, so this whole grounding of the protection of f rights in constitutional and legal uh, framework I think is 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 where then 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 when we get back to the unjust systems of the acquisition process, then I really don't know what is going to be a theoretical framework here. If we are looking at the relationship between the state and the individual in the context of how property rights are being grounded and being um, being being guaranteed, uh, then the whole framework within a constitutional and a legal uh, kind of a sense, uh, there then you have to explain how do you bring in this unjust dimension. Um, it's in, in in that sense I would I would uh, sort of go slightly uh, differently from what Mark was saying earlier that in that sense therefore there is no difference between India and China that one is democratic and one is authoritarian because I think that this is it's precisely this distinction and the manner in which I mean the the word constitution and constitutional guarantees and rights and property rights is simply not there in your paper and. I was thinking I would ask you this question that because it's it's such a significant element when you are looking at the whole concept of property rights uh, that either you've done it in a you know for a very specific reason uh, that is you've left it out deliberately entirely so I, I would like to really ask you why is it because you are clearly looking at the nature of the state and the individual uh, and trying to examine property rights in, in that way. So I'd like to know uh, that that's the first set of issues that I, I would like to uh, bring up. Uh, the second is the historical dimension, which again I think is extremely, um, it, it's a fantastic part of your paper that you're trying to bring in this whole historical aspect. Um, and yet I feel that uh, there is a certain gap again in, as we start to look at the whole historical issue. Uh, you uh, have identified this chain, Zareeb, I mean, again, interesting <laughs> relic. Um, so you go back to the Mughal period in, in many sense, which were the practices which the British employed. Uh, but the link between the Mughal period and the British is really, I mean, you take it very tenuously, and then the link between, say, the Mughals and the, uh, the, the post-colonial is also not, so, so see, why, why I'm saying is that if you look at our constitutional guarantees and the way in which the initial set of land reforms start to take off, the terms that are used go back to the Mughal period. In fact, one of the major arguments of that time was to make land reforms more effective. The terminology of the land holdings was Mughal. And therefore, uh, somebody like Irfan Habib, for instance, uh, is completely uh, missing from your references. I mean, he's, if at all, the authoritative source on agrarian uh, reforms of the Mughal period and the agrarian system. So if history is really uh, you know, going to be central in your, in your introductory framework, I would suggest that you do look at some of these linkages. And, and Habib has done a good job in terms of the way he looks at the Mughal period and the British period and 
so i mean there are problems with uh, which which you will uh, once you look at the whole discourse you will see that he has been contested uh, but i think it's one of the finest uh, analysis of the mogul agrarian system and the way in which it starts to uh, starts to be inherited by the british now um, one final thing about this business of um, of property rights political relationship between the individual citizens and the sovereign, um, the, um, this whole eminent domain theory. Now, what I find interesting is something, I mean, Hari raised this point about the fact that acquisition is not a problem because the land is owned by the state. Um, I don't think that's entirely it, because after all, why was there a need for land acquisition? Just, if, the, if the land is owned by the state in terms of forests and, and, and so on, uh, then, then why do you need a land acquisition? Because it, the, it, the question is uh, that you are taking the land from individually o owned land holdings uh, and so on. That's one. The other side of the coin here, very interestingly, is why does in the 90s this move speed up? That before then, we were happy to tinker with the uh, with, with the existing law. You had amendments coming up galore. In 77, you had this major move shift from being a fundamental to a statutory right. But why is it the 90s that you suddenly see this process speeding up? And two things are happening in India which have a bearing on your relationship between property rights and the state. One is the fact that liberalization comes to India, reforms start. And that is when the emergence of political parties begins in a, in a fundamental way. Uh, you see the era of coalition politics mostly goes back to the late 80s, early 90s, when different interest groups are responding to the liberalization process. Uh, there's not time enough to go into detail, but there is an interesting link between the emergence of new interest groups which coalesce into political parties, which then feeds into the very vibrant kind of state politics and new uh, groupings that come up. So the, the fact is that you have a process which begins in the 90s, which is related to the, to the liberalization process, which obviously then is lo looking at the way in which agrarian land or rural land holdings are now going to be used in the in the next stage of the developmental process. I mean, that's where the whole land acquisition business. I mean, then, then I think we we need to really look more closely at the nexus between the state, property rights, and the the kind of players that are involved. So it's ultimately, of course, the picture becomes more and more differentiated. You have you have a whole lot of you have pointed that out very well. It's it's a fairly kind of a complex uh, dynamics at work. But I think the core really, you, I mean, because there, it seems to me at after the initial point that there is just too many frameworks that you are trying to bring in. And I'm not too sure whether it's one thing to have a, a, have, have a, have a multidisciplinary kind of an approach, but another thing to bring frameworks which at some level become uh, contradictory, and so I just would like you to give some focus to that, and I'll stop. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Sanjay. Uh, Prakash, I enjoyed uh, your paper, but the presentation even better. <laughs> I go along with Alka on that. I have five uh, points uh, for your considerations. I think uh, what I'd like to see more in your paper is a, a far more critical engagement with discourses of dispossession, and especially how the state delegitimizes many of these discourses of dispossession. And uh, I say this because of the I'm very uh, attracted to the tenor and tone of your um, argument, and, and and I think you might find this useful to actually engage with that uh, um, delegitimization process, because there's this entire delegitimization of customary, the huge corpus of customary law and customary institutions and community access to land, uh, which we need to kind of bring in, which would kind of embellish some of the uh, uh, strong arguments you're trying to, or strengthen the arguments you're trying to make. So just an illustrative example, because this is, is, this is a, uh, your paper attempts a, a sort of a comparative India-China perspective. Look at the very similar 
um, uh, forced sedentarization policies that both Indian, Indian and the Chinese state governments, uh, state uh, uh, Indian, Indian and the Chi in Indian and the Chinese state follow towards pastoral nomads, uh, and that again busts the binary of uh, the authoritarian versus uh, um, uh, democratic. Um, uh, the uh, labeling that India-China comparisons are very often fraught with, and which are which is absolutely a, um, a, I mean not it's really not useful to actually push that. So it might be uh, useful to look at the forced sedentarization policies and see how pastoral nomads are delegitimized and present portrayed as irresponsible land managers, as backward, as uh, wasteful. And so this entire discourse enables in uh, the, the state in the pro in the process to acquire huge uh, swathes of um, acts, you know these rangelands and p pasture areas and um, and what what has been the default state policy has been to vacate these spaces of people and um, and the problem as we notice in, in in India just as well as much in China is that these spaces refuse to remain empty and it is bringing in its wake a whole I mean one uh, at one level a severe livelihood crisis uh, for um, uh, these pastoral nomads uh, but also at another level a very severe ecological um, uh, you know crisis of severe proportions so this could be one lens for you to kind of uh, look at a second one could be to and again um, given the tenor and tone of your paper to it might be useful to bring people back into these narratives more centrally. Of course, they are present everywhere in your in your paper, you you uh, in, in your argument. But the reason I say this is because um, somehow I get the impression that, um, and I read your paper a couple of times, and uh, so somehow I get the impression that inadvertently, the role of people seems to be reduced to being a mere site of state action or inaction. It's an inadvertent uh, impression, but it gives the impression that there's this, this, given the supervening authority of the and power of the state, the role of the, uh, the people is just that of, uh, as a site of state action or inaction. So it might be useful to, for instance, invoke Gyanendra Pandey and ask, what what right does this, does a subaltern uh, citizen have, and what claims does he have he or she have on state and state resources, and 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 to engage more in, uh, more uh, critically with what Pandey says about the living and very eloquently and powerfully I think about the living um, uh, living of individual in, in the living of individual and collective lives and the limitations of that living. So some of those narratives would come through if you were to bring uh, people back cent more cr centrally into this um, into this uh, account of yours. And third is um, a third point is uh, I, you ask the question: Do state governments exist um, in your paper? Sorry, yes, in local governments. I meant state. That's just a default Indian way of, uh, you know, equating to, to yes, uh, to uh, do uh, local governments exist? And you answer that they are missing in action from some of these debates. But I would say, if you were to look at it through from the point of view of the subaltern citizen and ask the question, do local governments exist? Oh, yes, they do, and they wield enormous discretionary power, and or, and 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 the subaltern citizen as very much at the risk receiving end of that, that enormous discretionary power. And just an illustrative example to substantiate that would be to look at the selective implementation of the Forest Rights Act of 2006. And you ask, your, uh, the and if you could ask the question about uh, um, the role of subnational governments, the local, local governments in implementation of, of, an, of a so-called progressive act like the FRA, uh, you look at the very regressive um, uh, piece of uh, notification from the West Bengal uh, Forest Department of t in 2011, which actually goes on to say that the FRA does not uh, uh, is not applicable to the Sundarbans. Uh, 
So in one stroke, the state is wielding this enormous discretionary power and um, creating a huge livelihood crisis uh, for um, a whole um, uh, you know, set of users who are dependent on this ecosystem. Um, and so that's, uh, that's then just uh, to my um, fourth uh, question, uh, no, fourth point, uh, there's, again, I would like to engage with a question that you ask in the paper, what difference does Indian federalism make? Uh, is, that's one of the questions you throw up. I would think that a more interesting intellectual question would be to ask what difference does asymmetrical federalism make? Precisely because it has huge, you know, implications for the questions on uh, resources and rights, and how questions of accountability need to be placed at the intersection between uh, questions of, you know, um, be before between resources and rights and the rights of citizens to access these. Uh, so, um, so it. So has so if I were to rephrase the question, has asymmetric uh, federalism um, delivered? Has this what has been a very um, uh, you know projected as a very uh, excellent a positive example of institutional innovation in terms of constitutional safeguards for customary uh, uh, law? Has it delivered over the course of the six decades, the shed scheduled six areas, and so on and so forth? You see a huge set of institutional gridlocks that have come in the way to undermine some of these. So that would be, again, another rich vein to tap. And I'll, I'll just one last, uh, the fifth point to um, just uh, conclude. Uh, you spoke about uh, social protest movements. It might be useful to also ask, do all social movements engage with the state in similarly? In the sense, i.e., do they always engage um, uh, you know, do they always um, engage with the state in an oppositional way? Uh, because you could also look at the very interesting puzzle that why does a socio-ecological uh, movement like Chipko uh, speak, uh, quote unquote, the language of the state? And why does it very consciously decide not to, um, not to question state legitimacy? Uh, that's it. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much. I think that the emerging scholars have benefited from a very rich uh, set of, uh, of comments by, by more established scholars, so I think it's a success already from that point of view. But uh, are there questions, comments uh, for the uh, speakers and or the discussants? I'm not sure we're going to have much time for responses unless we go beyond 4.15, which I'm... Well, I think we're already scheduled to, to end at 4.15, the entire session, including Professor Fraser's remarks. So and unless there's permission from the uh, Supreme Head to go beyond 4.15, I think we'll have to basically have very brief or no responses from the speakers. But are there any questions, um, comments, suggestions that we can take up uh, now? Yes, please. And uh, I think, as before, the, the request remains that if you don't mind coming here, it will aid the videotaping, but if you object, you may speak from wherever you are. <laughs> yeah. um, I, uh, my, um, I have uh, each uh, comment for uh, each of the first two articles, yes. uh, two presentations, and uh, those were already highlighted, uh, pointed out by the discussants. I just want to reinforce my, um, uh, my impression of the importance of, of, of these aspects. So for the uh, first uh, presenter, uh, uh, Nomura, uh, I, just, um, I, I think it's a really, uh, it will be very nice to frame your project uh, that for people who not the story of this particular period uh, to understand the significance uh, or even how your project fits in the large uh, discourse out there. Uh, because I, I think Professor Singh's point of framing and making it more uh, um, uh, connected with with discourses, the debate in the field, that will be very um, uh, great. Yeah, I, that's my uh, my impression. To the first thing I write down, the framing the question, and how you talk to other uh, specialists in the field, and uh, uh, the second one again, um, uh, uh, 
Professor Fraser also raised, uh, that is the, the local the local cases. You know, in the end, I find the local cases are most interesting element of your of your of your project. And uh, uh, if you can explain why these two cases, what are your initial findings? Uh, so uh, the Sikha versus Wukang and the Gujarat versus Chengdu. I can say Gujarat, but why Chengdu? Uh, so this paired comparison, I think that really are your bigger contribution. So make uh, good use of it and uh, also explain why these, these two pairs. I, I'm told we can go a little longer, so I think uh, there will be time for very brief responses uh, by the paper givers. So please do take note of the questions and comments that formulate your responses. If that's the case, may I ask Prakash to please tell us what was the China aspect of it that you didn't get to? In due course, yeah, please take note of that. Yes, please. Yeah, please speak loudly since yeah, we don't have sure. microphones. I, I have two questions for the two last presentations. Uh, um, for your presentation, my question is you, you talk about social justice. Okay, and I think uh, Professor Fraser pointed it out that uh, stalling uh, land uh, acquisition does does mean less of justice, more of justice. The other aspect that I would like you to look at is when there is a successful land acquisition project, people are displaced. What happens to the people who are displaced? You know, we are dealing with an urban phenomena where large numbers of people are moving into the urban setting, which are creating huge amount of problems in terms of social justice, at least in the context of India. So I think one aspect of land acquisition is this huge group of people who are being displaced, moved into and, uh, the 2012 uh, December you know, um, incident that took place in Delhi is now brought out as one of the markers of the problems that we are dealing with with, with that sort of a displacement. And for Prakash, slightly cheeky, I completely agree your premises that you know one needs movements. I'm all for movements. I was there in Shinwar on the ground, all of that. But does movements lead to social justice? Or where does one push that agenda? Because uh, you know, if one looks at Bengal, what happens when the most movements themselves become establishment? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, who, you know who, what does one do with that? Yes, at the back, please. And please introduce yourself if you could. Um, my name is Dinyar Alkaka. I am a development practitioner. Um, my question is for Dr. Bong. I thought that it might help to put his arguments in better focus and provide more context. If we could talk a little bit about the relative scale of land acquisition in China versus India. How many square kilometers of land is being acquired? Question number two, how do we, can we focus more clearly on the difference between acquisition versus expropriation, meaning what percent of the market value of the land is the state typically providing to um, those whose land is being acquired or expropriated? I think once we can see these issues in a clearer perspective, then the whole question of land acquisition in China versus India becomes much more clear. Thank you. Well, I, oh, first of all, I, have, I think I was just going to uh, add comments on the, uh, your question about this land acquisition and things. I have been searching for this kind of person about the land, you know, what's uh, the, the size of the land acquisition. I think it's really difficult to come by because they have a different way to measure that. Especially, I think it's in China, you might have a rough numbers, but Indian, I think it's, you know, we're having discussion with the Prakash, I think this is really difficult to, to, to know how what's the size of the land has been acquired. Okay, my question or comments on both papers, you know, Prakash and Ingo's papers, you know, can we actually find a common base to look at this, you know, say using a, a Prakash as a framework as well as property rights. Do we are we talking about the same type of property rights when we look at the land acquisition here? Because I think it's, you know, it's 
when we start to talk about this, you know, the property rights, we have to define that, you know, because there's a, a variety of the rights could be related to the property rights. You know, it could be, you know, the ownership. You, both of you are talking about this ownership of things. And the uh, union rights, which is, I think, is in the case of China. And uh, transfer, right, transfer rights, and also the rights of the compensation and the rehabilitation, which is, I think, is the focus of your paper. So, do we? <laughs> and actually, we're, you know, I would just ask both of you to give us a little bit, you know, um, a, a, you know, comparison, you know, about, you know, how we, when we talk about the property rights of the land, so what specific rights are we talking about? Thank you. Any other comments, questions? No. Okay, so I would just like to add one thought, uh, and uh, then I would invite the the uh, various speakers to respond, uh, and, try, and try to please keep your re responses to two minutes if you can. I know it's very difficult. It's going to be difficult, but uh, I'm sure you're all anxious to leave. Just uh, the, the following thought, irresponsible thought, since I have that privilege, <laughs> is that I think we should think harder about the role of land in economic development uh, and national development strategies generally. If you think about the reason for the um, the enormous uh, economic uh, power of the United States, uh, in in uh, uh, and and it's it's the challenge it posed to European uh, uh, countries uh, in the as it, as it as it as it emerged as an important power. I feel that I can talk about this since actually at the India-China Institute, we're also supposed to consider a third country, namely the United States, as part of our mandate. Uh, if, if you think about that, land was extremely important, obviously, the land-abundant nature of the United States, as international trade theorists would say. And uh, that, uh, of course, involves thinking of land in a broad sense. It's not just the physical land, though that was important. It was important, for instance, to the US-style production system. Um, the the assembly line production system, which often depended on having a large expanse of land, uh, but more generally on being able to extract resources, use them wastefully by the standards of the old world. Uh, and uh, this was apparently explicitly an aspect of the Nazi economic thinking. I've been reading a very interesting book by uh, Adam Tooze, who's an economic historian at Yale on uh, the way in which the Nazis thought about their grand strategy. And, ba and basically, they um, thought of the US, according to him, as the real enemy, which they had to uh, prepare to be able to deal with. And they thought of their European land war as being a preliminary step in their preparation for um, hegemonic contestation with the United States. And of course, their ideas of living space, Lebensraum, eastward expansion were all bound up with this. It involved creating a uh, a possibility of a form of economic development which allow, which which enabled them to contest the u s uh, in uh, by replicating its uh, its uh, land using approach to economic development uh, and I think in some sense, although we see the limits of the of, of that economic strategy very 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 directly today in the form of climate change and other evidence that, in fact, we don't have possibilities of limitless expansion. We very much have limits. Nevertheless, there's a sense in which the logic of national development strategies, which we are seeing, is one of replication of this mode, in which you think about uh, uh, clearing people from the land and using the land as much as possible uh, uh, to, to, um, to, to facilitate national development in one or another way. This is my responsible comment. I don't have any deep reflections about it, but it would be interesting to be on this, but it would be interesting to have some some uh, reactions at some point. Two minutes each. I think um, we could proceed in the same way that we, uh, same, same order in which we spoke. Please, Nirmala. And thank you for your very interesting presentation, which I have, have nothing to say about. <laughs> uh, thank you. I. Uh, I would like to react to what uh, Professor Tansen said about sources. I totally agree. My work has been, uh, in my work, I've basically looked at only the Indian sources, and I know the limitations of it. 
but looking at the British sources and the Japanese sources require resources and expertise, which I am working on it. Hopefully, I'll be able to do it over a period of time. Uh, uh, Professor Priyadarshi's book, very helpful, because he uh, has translated uh, uh, the Chinese uh, uh, newspaper articles on INA, uh, INA activities in China and Shabat Chandra Bose's uh, visit in China in 43 and 44. Both are very important. Uh, the book, uh, as, as a collection of primary sources, a very important book, and I have been using it. Uh, uh, but what I meant was that he doesn't really, uh, it's not an analysis of the INA's uh, activity in China. So, uh, I haven't looked at the modern review and the Indian annual registry, which I will do after I get back home. <laughs> uh, uh, your uh, comment on pan-Asianism is well, well taken, sir, and I'll, I'll look into it. And uh, also the question, uh, the comment on ja whether it's a Japan question instead of uh, a China question. I never thought of it. I know it made me think, actually. Thank you. Uh, and uh, the question did Professor Liu Chien asked, why did Subhas uh, <laughs> think of taking help from Japan? Very complicated question. I, but Subhas itself was a very complicated man. And probably after, uh, but I could only see that, uh, like I said in my presentation, he, he wanted to make the most of the opportunities with the war, uh, you know, which came out of the war. And probably the foremost thing in his mind was India's independence rather than what Japan was doing to China or doing in China. So that's all I can say. Uh, Professor uh, Minier's suggestion, very well taken, ma'am. I'll incorporate it when I rework my paper. Thank you. Thank you. Since a uh, lot of question toward uh, our two language um, uh, questions, uh, how to? I, I think I cannot respond one by one. So, uh, firstly, I, I will say that uh, to discuss and provide me uh, very good uh, instruction toward further research. So, as I mentioned, this is just the beginning of my research. So, many things have to do to and take into the further research. So that's very useful for me. And other things I need to, I think what I'm saying is like the, actually India and China are in different kinds of the stage of modernity. That's what I'm saying. That's, that's what I am, I, I'm, I'm that's to, uh, that's the, why I, I come to this question, just because I, I think about buying the more but being the more the social ori origin of the democracy and Dictatorship, and democracy. That's why. So uh, that means, like, uh, in terms of the urban urban uh, population rate, in terms of the uh, manufacturing. Uh, so I, I think there's far more than economic growth difference between India and China. There will be a different society. China will will soon become more and more industrial society, and in India maybe more brutal. But in India. As, as the by the most short, Indian pursue that is modernity through Lang Wan Orleans rather than capitalism revolution or communism revolution. So this means they are going on their own way approach modernity. So that's why I'm working on here through this land. We can see a lot of things in in, in this land acquisition. A lot of things are are implied in this kind of issues. So that's why I'm trying to working on. It. We want to, we I want to understand what uh, there are different approach to modernity, even though there are difference of ideology toward modernity. But even this kind of different ideology toward modernity of development is some kind of uh, depend dependent variable. We need to look into. We need to learn to why Indians think they are thinking about modernity. They are thinking about development is totally different from China. Why this happen? So this is what I'm long term project I'm trying to working on, trying to work on. So this is so. Just thank you for your suggestion. I will take uh, serious about all your suggestions. Thank you very much. Yes. I, 
I think we should call you Barrington Moore from now on. It's, very, it's quite an impressive statement of your future project. Uh, thank you uh, to the two commentators. Thank you so much for sort of indulging me in a variety of arguments. And as I'm, you know, I really appreciate your bearing through my very disorganized paper. Um, uh, and I'll run through, you know, this one comment from each of the commentators and, and respond to some of the other questions. Um, you know, I look at the question of the uh, whole uh, discussion of constitutional rights from an everyday state perspective. So anything that doesn't filter onto the ground and is not effective in actually assuring the effective of rights on the ground is for me kind of, you know, up there, but it doesn't really work. Uh, but it doesn't mean it's not important, but I think I'm not I'm unable to sort of integrate that into uh, my discussion as effectively as I probably should do. Um, uh, on Nimi's question about uh, the discourses of dispossession and their delegitimization, uh, that's you know my struggle between my heart and my mind. So <laughs> I think I'll leave it at that. Um, uh, Tansin's, uh, so the, my art, uh, hypothesis, I was going to give you some hypothesis about China-India comparative studies, and my argument would be that nature of state society relations in India are much more heterogeneous in, uh, internally compared to what they are in China. And uh, because of that, the um, comparative studies of India-China should be sub-national sub studies. And I think Huang's proposal of you know, studying one region in, in India and one region in China is you know, perfectly along that line. So that's, that's my idea of sort of, you know, and it borrows from some of the literature on property rights in Africa and all of that. Um, um, movements, I critically engage with movements, and that's why I think they struggle, so I think uh, that makes sense. Um, uh, property rights, the nature of property rights, uh, you definitely we want to do that. I think that should be the next project, to map exactly the nature of property rights and how they are being reapportioned or you know, acquired or expropriated. Um, and that's all. Thank you. So um, I think we will have concluding remarks now from uh, Mark Fraser, Professor Fraser, my colleague. Yes, very quickly. I, I know what I'm standing bet between you and the, and the reception and the, and the next discussion, actually. Um, so I was invited uh, to make some uh, remarks that would sort of bookend the opening uh, comments from this morning, and uh, I, I think uh, Ashok for that. Um, I was particularly struck by um, uh, the, the concept of margins um, that that it, that uh, Ashok frequently brings up, and I think uh, I think margins and borders and movement across borders is also a way of, of thinking about this. I prefer you know, myself. Margins is a many-layered concept, a many-layered term. Uh, what is marginal to one person may be mainstream to another. Uh, if you talk to people who work on uh, Latin America or Africa, and you say India China Institute, they'd say, "Oh well, how do I get to the margins? If that's the margins, uh, you know, India and China, everyone's talking about them these days." So, it, it, I don't want to get give the emerging scholars the impression that you know you're 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 stuck in the margins. Uh, you're you're in uh, what I think is a, a very interesting. Uh, you know, you could call it margins, you could call it mainstream, but a border crossing. Uh, space uh, that, that we all engage in uh, in different ways. Uh, I prefer border crossing and I think it fits well with, uh, it turns out very well, with all of the papers uh, that we had today. If I had to, if I was asked to write a concluding chapter to a co-edited volume, if we were going to try to do that from this, and I know we're not, uh, I, I would really say that in one way or another, all of these uh, papers today dealt with the issue of, of border crossing, um, uh, we're talking about uh, border outposts. We're looking at hybrid forms that exist uh, in political economies uh, between uh, people on either sides of, of, of uh, often arbitrary borders. Uh, we're seeing how mainstream approaches uh, fit or don't fit, or where they, if they don't fit, how they need to be revised when we're looking, uh, we're placing something like property rights into the historical and political uh, and cultural context of, of China and India. Um, and you know, the other thing we're doing today, of course, is crossing the border uh, between uh, junior and, and senior uh, scholars. Um, to be more specific about it, we had the, the papers, uh, we had Himalayan border, we had linguistic borders, we had investment borders this morning, uh, the creation of investment zones, which is a new kind of, of, of bordering space. In the afternoon, we saw the literal military occupation and the borders that that entails and the ambiguities that that entails for the people inside the occupied territories. Uh, and of course, uh, land acquisition with the last two papers, the state-led project of drawing borders, of saying uh, this will be 
an area that we denote for, we, we designate for development. Uh, we decide who will get to live in it, who will not be able to live in it, and what we do uh, with these areas to be uh, brought under uh, development, uh, so-called. Um, a word to uh, the emerging scholars, a few words. Um, I think that uh, this, uh, I hope you'll agree with me that this has been a great opportunity uh, for you. Uh, I very much wish that in the, someone in the mid-1990s had invited me to uh, bring my uh, uh, work in progress, my recent PhD out, uh, to engage in a conversation of people who were not comparative political scientists or political economists, and uh, I had the chance to receive a, a different kind of feedback. Uh, than, than you would normally get, and, and I hope that it has been useful for uh, each of you. Um, remember that we'll be posting uh, the recording of today's session, uh, that which was able to be recorded by the mic. The questions, I guess, are outside that border. Uh, but we'll be posting this soon, uh, in a few days, and you, know, you can go back. I would encourage you to go back and, and listen to uh, the discussants' comments uh, and your own presentation. Uh, but, but for feedback, uh, you know, listening to the discussants' remarks on your paper a second time might be especially useful to get things that you may not have missed, uh, may have missed uh, uh, the first time around today. Uh, please keep us apprised of, of your progress, of, of uh, publications that might uh, be forthcoming. Some of them are noted in your bios uh, today. But we're particularly interested in the ways in which your engagement with uh, the China-India comparison has uh, uh, generated a useful uh, publication uh, venues uh, for, for your, your research. Uh, finally, I want to say uh, personal thanks uh, to, uh, because I don't get to very often, but to uh, my, my colleagues uh, at the India China Institute, both Ashok and, and Sanjay Reddy. Uh, and in particular, though, for today's uh, session, uh, for the work, all the work that was involved uh, uh, in putting this together and putting it together so well. I want to thank the, the ICI staff. Ashok mentioned by name this morning, of course, but I want to add my personal thanks to uh, all the work uh, that, that went into this and, and carrying it off so well.